So for the last part of the class before the weekend, we are continue to, to look at this um, uh, OSPF program or uh, link state uh, algorithm. So I remember what we saw before the break is that you collect all local representation from routers. You get this representation and you are able to draw a map of the network. So now what we are going to do is to run an algorithm called shorted path first that will help us to find the shorted, short, shorted path tree to go to every prefix. So this algorithm has been designed by Distra and the complexity is quite high because it's a square of number of entry in your, um, in your database. Okay, so let's try to do it on. So I am router A and then we will do, you will be a router and you will have to, to run this uh, algorithm and start also your uh, create also your forwarding information base. Okay? So, here I think, so uh, I am A, but uh, here you are three. It's like uh, the topo we try to, to make the same topology as, as a network. Okay? So, here I am A. So, I'm looking into my database and I know on which network I am connected. So I'm connected on alpha and I'm connected on beta and here it says that the cost for alpha is 10 and the cost for beta is 100. So I have this and then I know that from alpha I can join B and from alpha I can join C and from beta I can join D. So the algorithm is called shorted path first because they are going to look first at the shorted path. So here I have 10, 10 and 100. So I will, here I have two choices. One is B, one is C. So I will arbitrarily select B to continue to explore this shorted path. So here I am in B. So here I look what I can do with B. So I, with B, I can go to 20, to, to alpha, with a cost of 20. It's not very interesting because here I can go directly to alpha with a cost of 10. So I will remove this entry from the network. I will also form the graph. Then, so, two entry appears. It's gamma with a cost of 110 and delta with a cost of 110. Shorted path first, so I have to explore the shorted path in that graph, or in that tree. So here it's C, so I'm going to see what I can do with C. I can go to alpha with a cost of 20. I don't care because I have already a way to go to alpha with a cost of 10 and I can go to epsilon with a cost of 20. Okay? So here, I keep epsilon because epsilon doesn't appear. Shorted path first, so 110, 110, 20, 100. So I will look at this entry and see where I can go. So from epsilon, I can go to F with a cost of 20. Shorted path first, so I look here at F, and I look where I can go. I can go to Xi with a cost of 30, and then from Xi, I can go, go to E with a cost of 30. Shorted path first, so I look at this, and here I can go to delta with a cost of 130. And delta is already here with a cost of 110. So this entry is not interesting, so I will not explore it. So now I have finished with this part of the tree. So I look at shorted path. 
So 110, 110, 100. So I will look at D. From D, I have a cost. I can go to delta with a cost of 200, but I have here delta with 110, so I don't care. And I can go to eta with a cost of 110. Shorted paths first, so all the entries now are 110. So I explore one. I can go to D here with a cost of 110, but D is already here with a cost of 100. I can go to E with a cost of 110, but here I have a cost of 30. So I have finished here. I go, so I have explored all the possible things because from eta I cannot go somewhere else. So here I have my shorted path tree. So it says that when I want to go to a prefix, I know that this path is the shorted path. But when I want to fill my routing table, I don't want to put F because F is not a next up. In a routing table, you always put in the next up something, someone you can, you can directly join. So you are going to cut your tree as the, at this level, and you will say that to go to gamma and delta, I can you send it to, I think it's B, yes? I can send it to B. To go to epsilon and xi, I will send it to C, and to go to eta, I will send it to D. So this way I have my entry for my fib. And then I will put it on my fib. Okay? So this is, uh, of course, a stupid example, <laughs> just to play routers. But you see that you have done two things. First thing is was to compute uh, from this knowledge your shorted path tree, and from your shorted path tree, then you populate, you write another piece of paper, your fib, and when I give you a packet, or you, you don't read your database, or your, your, your shorted path tree, you just have to look at your fib. And the fib contains the list of all all the prefix that are available on your link, on your network. So here we have discovered all the possible prefixes. This is due, in fact, because we have a flooding before, and we get all the knowledge from all the routers. So this way it was easy to discover all the prefixes. So normally, none of you would have said, I don't know this prefix, because you, were, you had a totally uh, global view about the network. And from your fib, so you can go everywhere. You can send to the next stop. So now, there is a very important point to understand when we talk about Chartered Path 3. This is a purely local vision. It means that when you take decision to build your tree, you don't talk with others. You are alone on the network. And you don't take a decision because another router took another decision. It was based only on your database. It means that here we don't, always, for example, E, as defined a shorted path tree. And for example, here you have the shorted path tree, path tree from E to eta. I don't know if you got the, the same value, but here for, uh, from, sorry, is a shorted path tree from F to eta. So from F to eta is, I can send it to C, then I send it to A, and then I'm sending to D and then to eta. So that was the local decision of F. So it, I start from E. So E is the same thing. I, I'm sending to F, then to C, then to A, then to D, and then to eta. Now if we look at 
the path taken by a packet. So E sends something so to eta. So E C the next step, and the next step is F. Then F look at the next step, and the next step is C. But here, C may choose different things. C, for example, can say to join D and eta, I'm going to send it to B. Okay, if you look here on the tree, to go to eta with B, it will be 10 plus 100. And to go through A, it will be also 10 plus 100. Okay? So it means that here, C take a local decision to forward the packet to C. So it means that here, my packet will go that way. Okay? And if we look at the shorter path tree from E, normally the vision of E was the packet will go that, that way and will go through A. Okay? So we don't have this. So, because everything is based on local decision. So don't imagine that when you have selected a path, that your packet will follow that path. What you are sure is that the cost will be the same. Because otherwise, some shorted paths will exist and you will have notice it. So here you have the shorted path to go to ETA, but there is possibly different choice to go there. And so you cannot do tra really traffic engineering because you are not sure of the decision of other routers. And for example, we can have something more complex. For example, I have prefix alpha, and my next stop, say I have to send it to host A, or router A, sorry. And router A will say, so this is A, for alpha dot 100 and, so 24 is here, 128 slash 20, 25, I send it to C, and alpha dot 0 slash 25, I send it to D. Okay? So here, from my host, I'm sending, I know, that I think that all my packet will follow the same path. But this router decide to split it in two prefixes. And so here, my packet that I send to the next stop will not follow the same path. So, it's not because you have a local decision that you send your packet to a next stop that then all the packets will follow the same path after. So, if you have a very nice vision of the network in your RIB, routing information base, because you have the full topology, when you go to the FIB, you are short-sighted. You just see the next stop and you don't know where the packet will go after. So that's uh, a problem because you cannot manage, if you're a provider, it's your IGP, internal gateway protocol, so your internal routing protocol that decides for you how to send the packet. And you, do, you don't have a very precise control of this on the network. So that's good because you don't have to think it's IGP that does the job. But if you must want to be more clever, then you will have to fight against your routing protocol. So, now we are going to, to see a problem with link states. Imagine that this link between A and D is not very good. So sometimes it appears up, and sometimes it appears down. What do you do? What do you have to do, for example, when B goes down? A is to flood 
the network with another information. And for example, here, I will flood the network, giving my new vision of the topology, which means that I can reach alpha with a cost of 10, and that's all. And I will not give overfix. So what, what this imply is that all the other routers, all the routers in the network, have to recompute their shortest path tree. Because your topology has changed. So maybe there is some path that doesn't exist anymore. Or, so you have to recompute it. And now if B beta reappears, then you have to f flood again the network. And you will ask all the router to do again the shortest path tree. So that's something possible. But the problem is that, you remember, the complexity of this algorithm is n square. So since it's n square, it's very, very expensive to uh, run it all the time. And here I have only very few uh, links. If I have more links, then I will have a, a problem. So that's why we can try to We can try to simplify our network or divide your, our network into areas. And dividing a network into areas, I will run a shorted path tree only on my area. And I will just know the topology of my area, but I will not know what I have in other areas. I will just get some summaries. So we are going to to see an example here. So I have a backbone. So in fact, the OSPF topology is very, very simple. You cannot create very complex topology. In fact, you will have a backbone, and the backbone is area 0. If you don't want to divide your network in other area, so everything will be on your backbone on area 0. If you want to divide your network in more areas, so you will do it that way, and you will always be connected to your backbone. You don't, you are not connected. For example, it's impossible to be connected directly from area 1 and area, zero, area 2. All the connections are between an area with a number of difference from 0, to area 0, so the backbone. So you can have this topology. It means that you can have different, several routers that connect you from the backbone to your area. Or you can have also one, only one router that connects you to uh, this area. So now we are going to see how it works. So here in area 1, I will do the same thing I have done previously. It means that I will synchronize my local vision of the network. So this way, I will get all the local vision of the network. I can build the, to the topology of the network, run the shortest path tree, and populate my five fib with prefixes and next up. So I will do that. So here, for example, we have a prefix alpha. This prefix alpha, after a certain period of time, will be known by all the routers. Particularly, these routers, which are in a boundary, so it means that they have one, some interfaces in area 0 and some interfaces in area 1. So we run different databases. So if you have you look at what we have done here, in fact, on the green part, I don't talk about routing. In the green part, is just database synchronization. I have one information, and I share this information with 
the others. And I have protocol that guarantees me that there will, we will have no, loss, no losses in information. So, it's what we have here. So, I have a protocol that allows me to send information on all routers. So, here what I do, I create a new entry in my database. I create a new database. In green, it's what we call the topological database. So here you have, you can build your network. So you know all the prefixes. You know all the links. And now, I am going to create what I call a summary database. So what is a summary database? It's a database that just gives me a prefix and a cost associated to the prefix. So here, I know that the cost is 30 because I have the topological vision of my network, so I know that it's 30. Here, I know that for alpha, the cost is 60 because I know the topological uh, part of this network and I know that the cost is 60. But I will not bother the backbone with all the topological detail. I will just forward this information, flood the backbone with this information. So what I will have is that all the routers here will share this blue packet, or this blue information. They will, not, they will never have the green part because the green part, the green information, the topological information is just sent on my uh, area, oh, sorry, database. yes, database. It's always database, but we synchronize, synchronize more things on it. And here, so here, of course, I have a topological database that correspond to area zero. So you see that router R1, R2, and R3 will have two topological database. R1 and R2 will have a topological topological database for area 0 and area 1. And here, router R3 will have a topological database for area 2 and one topological database for area 0. Okay, so I have two separate topological databases, but from that I create summaries. So here, I have a router. So this router here uh, receives two announcements. One from R1 that says that there is somewhere in the network. It don't say that it's in area one. We don't care about area. We just know the, existing, the existence of this uh, prefix. And it says that there is a prefix alpha and the cost is 30. And it knows also that this prefix alpha can be reached through R2 and the cost is 60. So, what do you do? So, I remember your, your goal is to populate the fib, so to add an entry in the forwarding information base, where you will have alpha, and after that, next stop, and next stop is an equipment that you can directly join. Okay, so in my database, I cannot save, for example, alpha with a cost of uh, 30 is the cheapest, so I send my packet to R1 and put R1 in my fib. Because I cannot join directly R1, I have to cross plenty of routers in the backbone <coughs> to cross R1. So in fact, here, I have a topological database for backbone. So I know the cost to go to the prefix of R1. And from my topological database for backbone, I know that this cost is 50. And to join R2, I know that the cost is 5. So I had both costs. If I use R1, 
the global cost will be 50 plus 30. So it will be 80. If I join, I go through R2, the cost will be 60 plus 5. So 65. So what does it mean? It means that R2 is closer to the destination. Or R2 plus me make a closer path. So I say, okay, I'm going, going to send my packet to R2. But I cannot put into my fib to join alpha. I have to send it to R2 because R2 is not directly reachable. But I know the prefix of R2. I have my topological database. So I know on my tree which branch of my tree goes to R2. And then, same thing, I look at the first level, and the first level will give me the next stop. And I will put this router as the next stop to send the packet to Alpha. Okay? So you see here it's a little bit tricky, but we are playing with two databases. One summary that gives a very unprecise vision of what you have in an area and your precise vision of what you have in your area. And when you combine both, you are able to create your, your film. So, one other solution, what could be interesting, for example, but here I will have a more or less uh, accurate vision of the network is to, to define my network such a way, in a such a way that when uh, I am a router here, I have this area and I have plenty of prefixes. Let's say alpha dot uh, 192 slash 26, alpha dot 128 slash 26, etc., etc. So plenty of prefixes. So here I can send directly because I have this knowledge of the topology. But outside of the network, I must just send alpha slash 24. So I do an aggregation. So this way I don't bother all the equipment here with the complexity of my network. I just say here it's the area for alpha. There another area will be area for betas. And then I subnet into the areas. So this way I don't have to populate the information, the routing database here, with a lot of information. I will just give one prefix per area. So this is a good solution, but you see if you de do aggregation, then I cannot say here I have a cost of 30. Because 30 is for this prefix. This one, maybe I will have a pre uh, prefi this link here, a prefix that is here, will have a cost of 50. So outside I have to make a summary and give a summary also of the costs. But this way we can reduce announcements. So for example here, you see that in, in blue, I will announce here prefixes that I have learned from area 0 and area 2. How it's possible? This, in this area, S3 is uh, sending is participating to the topological database of this network. So S3 get all the prefixes, will inject them in the area 0, and then all these router here, and of course R1 and R2 will receive the summary from area 2, and we can inject it here. And I also inject a summary of area 0. Outside of my network, 
Here I will just inject the prefix of my area. Now we have this case, R2. And area 2, sorry. In area 2, is it necessary to give a summary of area 1 and area 0? How many ways I have to leave my network? But how can I leave area 2? We have different possibilities. There is only R3. There is no other choices. In area 1, I can live through R1, or I can live through R2. But here, no. There is only one possibility. So it means that it's not necessary to announce the complexity of the world, but I can just announce a default prefix. And this way, I will simplify the announcement in this area. So this kind of area where you have only one way to live, it's what we call a stub area. An area where you have different place, different possibility to exit, it's what we call a transit area. Okay? So here I can send a default prefix. Of course, it's not the same behavior. Because suppose that I'm sending a packet to a prefix that doesn't exist on my network. If I was sending here the complexity of the network, then this router will have known that this prefix doesn't exist. Here, they don't know, because they have a default route. So, they send it to the default router, and the default router knows that this route doesn't exist, and then send an ICMP message to tell that he cannot forward the packet, because he has no way to, to send for a uh, to find the next stop to send the information. Okay? So, this is one, uh, one thing. So here you see what we, we have done, is to, split, to split our network into areas. So this way, we can uh, simplify the topology, the topology discovery. If I, was, I had only one area, it means that I will have to look at all the topology and make a shorted path tree on all the topology. Here I have three areas in parallel. So that's one interest. So we have already two databases. One is for the topological database, and the other one is for the summary. Now we are going to create another database. And this database will be used for external prefixes. So it's something we, we are going to learn in more details next week when we will see BGP protocol. But your BGP protocol will give you prefixes that are outside of your area. Okay. So here you are, you are a provider, and you are connected. You are connected through BGP, so you have a link to another provider. Or here you are a company. This is your company network, and you are connected to Telmex. And you do BGP exchange to get information from Telmex. So here you may learn some prefixes coming from uh, Telmex. Of course, in one approach, we'll see that it's not the best one. But what we can do here is to inject all the prefixes inside the area, net, the area on your autonomous system, your, your domain. So how can we do that? So here, you remember, we have databases. We have a mechanism that allows us to flood the network. So easily, I can flood my, this information on my whole network, on my whole area. It's arrived to this router S3, and this router S3 can flood it into the backbone, 
And then it arrives to R1 and R2, and R2 and R2 can flood it into the back, onto area one. So this way, the prefix I have learned through BGP will be learned by the other equipment. So one possibility, for example, is here to, when you want to, to reach this uh, prefix, so you will know which router has announced it here, as what we did when we are, were looking for the prefix alpha from this router. And so you know where, how to live, how to join R3, and then how to join this equipment. So here we have the different database that we can find in, um, in OSPF. So here, just um, for information, this area now is no more a stub area because you have two ways to leave your area. One is through S3, and the other one is through BGP, or the router that, is, that uses BGP. So now you have to make a selection. So it's this more difficult to just announce the default one. OK? So next step is to see the magic. Magic things we have put in, uh, in the network. So I told you at the beginning, every router has his own configuration. And then by a magic application, then all the router will know all the knowledge of the other. So now we are going to see how this protocol works. So here, oh yes, no, we'll talk about that after. So here I have my router. So my routers have, in fact, until now, I call them A, B, C, D, but it's a name and it's not correct. Normally, I just manage IP addresses. So it means that I have here a router that will have an address, alpha.2, gamma.1, and delta.1, for example. So what I will do is to select one of these addresses, or each address is unique. I will select one that will become the router ID. Because here you see, if I look at the IP address, I have different identity, identity regarding the interface I'm using. So I want in my network to have only one identity, so I will take one of these address as my identity. And now, what are we going to do is first to discover my neighbors. When we we talk, when I gave you this example, uh, the example, to, you did not know what were your neighbors. So you have, in fact, to discover with whom you can talk. And your network manager will never give you the list of router you have to talk with. So it's the job of a router to discover its neighbors. So when you, you are in a point-to-point -point link or in a broadcast network, it's very easy. What do you do? You send a broadcast message. This broadcast message is what we call a hello message. And it will be a very short message. And this message will be broadcast on the link. So one, one advantage if you compare that to RIP. Hmm? RIP. RIP protocol, distance vector. Yes, RIP, check every 30 seconds. Here we have 10 seconds. So why we can send faster this message compared to RIP? More than that, we don't send routing information. Here is just a small message that says, I am arrived and I want to have new friends on my link. Okay? So, what you send here, if suppose that only delta 1 is up, then periodically you will send a message, say, I'm the delta 1, and here is the list of my neighbors. 
And here I am very sad because I have no friend. I have nobody to talk with. And now suppose that we switch on alpha 1. So alpha 1 will sorry, send an hello message. This hello message say, OK, the designated router, we will see what it is after, is delta 1. And my neighbors is delta 1. And delta 1 is very happy when he receives this. Because here, it means that we have a bidirectional connectivity between alpha and delta. Because since alpha put my address, it means that alpha was able to receive my message. And since I receive a message from alpha, it means that I can receive message from alpha. So I have something that is bidirectional. And that's very important to have bidirectionality because suppose that we have an optical fiber. And that optical fiber is cut somewhere. So you can receive a signal from the other part, but you cannot send to the other part. So if we don't have bidirectionality, it means that you can send routing uh, uh, prefixes, say, OK, I'm ready to get the traffic from epsilon. So V over 1, so you say, I'm ready to get the traffic from epsilon. And this one say, OK, it's very good. He has a very good cost, so I will send the packet to him. But the connection is not bidirectional, so you are not able to send, to receive the packet. So it means that here we have created a black hole because you announce a prefix and you cannot forward packet to that prefix. So first thing we have to do, and that's the goal of Hello Protocol, is to check that we have a bidirectional link between these two equipment. Now that we have a bidirectional link, what we are going to do? We are going to exchange not our database, because our database can be very, very huge. I remember here, I forget to tell you, but if I'm doing full BGP here, I will receive 350,000 routes. So, and I will have to copy them on all the routers. So it's not a good idea. We'll see how we can avoid this. But so it means that my database, can, my router here can be connected to BGP, and I can have 350,000 words. So, we will just describe what we know. So it means that we will not give all the information, but just a key to that information. And then, I will ask things I don't know. If I don't know, is this router or the prefix, and I don't know, I don't have it in my database, so I will request this information and the router will send this information. Same thing on the other side. If I describe something that Alpha 1 doesn't know, then I will request, Alpha 1 will request it, and then I will send it to Alpha 1. So this way, I first tell all I, all I know, and then we exchange all things, and after a certain period of time, those, these two routers will have synchronized their database. So they will know the same information and so they can start computing things. Now, suppose that I start here alpha 3. So alpha 3 will do the same and will have to describe things with delta 1 and alpha 1. So normally what we can imagine is to send database description to delta 1 and say here what I know and collect things that the other knows and I don't know. And normally I have to do it also with alpha 1. And this will be a big mess because I will have to talk with all the routers. And normally our goal is to synchronize things. So most of the router knows about the same thing. 
So, to avoid to talk with all the routers, then we are going to create a kind of hub, and we will only talk with one router. And this router is the one we call designated router. You are designated router for one link. So, on each link here, you will have different designated router. For example, this router can be designated router for link alpha and for link delta, and not for link gamma. But we'll, you will have only one designated router in your link. So, what does it mean? It means that now I describe things only with the designated router, and maybe the designated router will learn things from me. If the designated routers learn things for me, from me, then after that, it will broadcast them on the link. So I have learned a new information, so I send it on the link. So this way, Alpha 1 can learn it. And here it's a good point for Alpha 3, because if Alpha 3 receives the message, then seeing the the broadcast will be viewed as an acknowledgement. So it's sure that Delta 1 gets the information. I remember we are, I remember you, we are in a datagram network, so we can lose packets. In IP, in a RIP, it's not a problem. Because if I lose a packet, the packet will be, or the prefix will be resent in after 30 seconds. So, sometimes I can lose information, it doesn't matter. But here, I send only one information. I don't resend it again. So, if this router doesn't get it, it will not have the same database as me. And if all the router doesn't share the same database, then the routing protocol will not work. Because you will not have the same global vision of the network, and so you may create loops. So it's very important to have a reliable uh, flooding in your network. So here, I send it. I send the information in multicast. So it's an acknowledgement for Alpha 3. Alpha 1 may have received it, but I'm not sure. Because I am in a datagram network. So Alpha 1 we'll have to acknowledge. With VLO protocol, I have learned all the neighbors on my link. So I can wait for an acknowledgement of all my neighbors. And this way, I am sure that all the router will share the same information. Okay? So here, what I have described to you is how to make a reliable uh, flooding on a link. So, you describe your information, you ask for what you don't have, you get it, and you acknowledge what you get to be sure that everything is correct. You have not lost any information. I don't have to acknowledge alpha.3 here, because when I receive information from alpha.3, I will have, uh, I will send a flooding message. So I receive something, for example, for prefix phi. So I put this prefix phi in the database, and then I, f I send a multicast message with prefix phi. So alpha 3 will see the same prefix phi, and say, okay, he has received the information, and I've sent it on the link. If it was not the case, then alpha 3 will resend it. So here, I describe flooding, reliable flooding, on a link. Now we have to do it on the area. So how we can do that? Here, I have a database. On each node here, I have routers. I have a database. And this database is common for this router. So now what can I do? is to do the same on the other links. So I will describe what I know with this my 
designated router. For, for example, if you look here at gamma delta dot one, he is not designated router in the other prefixes. So he will describe what he knows to this one and send the information to C1 and beta 2. And beta 2 will, of course, acknowledge the information. So this way I have sent information to this one. I have sent information and alpha 3 sent to C2. And then, of course, you continue this phase. What you have learned, you send it to, for example, if you look at the C1, C1 is designated router, so C1 will flood the information on the link, and this information will be received by C2. But C2 has already the information in its database. So C2 will not propagate again this information because it's already stored in its memory. Same thing here. Beta 2 send it to alpha 1, but alpha 1 has already the information. So alpha 1 will not propagate it on over links. So this way, you see, we have flood the information on all the node of my, or the router of my area. So this is a way to flood, of course, there is a problem. It's that normally here, if my topology change, I cannot detect it. Because suppose that alpha 1 has an interface here that appears and disappears. So we have to, to send again the information. But this router may say, okay, I already know about alpha 1, so I don't care about this information. So what you are going to do is to add to your information a sequence number. And each time you change something in your database, in your because you have an interface that appears or an interface that disappears, then you increment your sequence number. And so here, if I have a new sequence number, it will be viewed as a new information. And so I will start threading it and send it to the other equipment. So this is one, uh, one thing. So this way is the most reliable. But sometimes we have problems. Some information that stay in the memory of routers because one router died, died and so we continue to keep the information. So to avoid this, we add an edge to the information. And this edge is incremented up to 40 minutes, if my memory is good. And after 40 minutes, we discard this information from the router. So before 40 minutes, if the information is still variable, then you have to issue a new information with a new sequence number. And this way, it will be flooded again on your network. Okay? So, you see that it's a little bit more complex than RIP. RIP, we just take uh, half an hour to describe how it works, and it, it is a very simple protocol. Here, in fact, for OSPF, or for the link state protocol, then we have to describe at least four protocols. One is LO, to discover your neighbors. Then we have to describe how to exchange information. So description, then get the information, and then acknowledge the information. So it's much, much more complex to implement. If you look at the RFC, so the document that describe OSPF, they are very, very big compared to, uh, to RIP. <coughs> 